Welcome to the second episode of In Conversation With, an opportunity for me to sit down with industry leaders and future stars to talk about how they're helping to shape the future of hospitality. This week, I'm joined by the unstoppably interesting Matt Chatfield of The Cornwall Project, publisher turned chef turned publican turned farmer. We talk about how he took over the family farm, why you don't need to go vegan to save the world, and the future of agriculture. It's a really interesting conversation. Matt's got so much to say on the topic. So make yourself a cup of tea, sit down and enjoy the conversation. And please do try and stay to the end, either watching this as a video or having it on in the background. I promise it'll be worth it. Um, why don't you start by just introducing yourself and broadly the journey that you've gone on to get to where you are today and what you're currently up to. Um, okay, so I'll try to briefly. Um, so come from a long line of farmers. Um, we've actually farmed the same land in Devon. Um, it's a small holding, but we've farmed that for about 400 years. Um, we were actually, we're called yeomen actually. So if you go to my family graveyard, um, then, you know, it goes right back to three or 400 years and like on a, quite a few of the graves, you know, it's actually yeoman, which is, um, and yeoman is essentially people who, yeah, farmed on behalf of a sort of bigger estate. So we farmed on behalf of a bigger estate. My granddad, um, because of inheritance tax, was able to buy the farm about 40 years ago. But just as he bought it, it was like coming to that stage where farming was becoming very difficult. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to go all Brexit or anything, but, you know, we did join um, the you know the European Union and it did change agriculture and it, you know and a lot of things happened where with supply chain so he farmed about thirty five cows Frisian cows um, he actually farmed it you know he was encouraged he was at, he was a part of that time when farmers were given a load of money to basically change the land a lot um, rightly or wrongly well wrongly actually um, so when we were growing up it was just a point where he wasn't able to make a living from that small farm. It was only 80 acres um, and he just never encouraged us to do it because I think, you know, he was working harder and harder and I think he just thought that's not the life he wants for us. So it wasn't really an option really, even though I just loved every minute of farming. Mum actually set up her own dairy farm um, and that, you know, she worked like hard, really hard, but that just didn't work as well because it was that time, of, you know, it just wasn't feasible. So then anyway, um, I then went to college, um, college and then, yeah, left Cornwall. Um, and then uh, did environmental studies at college, but then I ended up working in publishing for about 12 years. Um, not very good at it at all, sort of like, but yeah, so I actually did advertising sales and then led to sort of become a publisher. Wow. Did work, work for some quite interesting things, um, but it was fairly hedonistic, really. Um, then my granddad died, and I, that was during my hedonistic stage, um, and I just didn't take it seriously as I said, You know, I went down to see him a couple of times, and I was almost trying to ignore it, really, because mm. it was such a bad, it, was, it wasn't a particularly nice death. Um, but then my nan, who was very close to, sort of six years later, she became very unwell. And then I decided, you know, that time I went down and spent like a huge amount of time. It was a pretty horrible six months, but I spent a lot of time, you know, by her bed and stuff. Um, it was during that stage I was like realizing I need to change my life and, you know, maybe try and do something. So I decided then to try and make the farm. I thought, you know, I need to sort of make some promises to her, really. And one was to, you know, make the farm actually work. Um, but to do that, um, I had to. I knew that if I was just trying to make a small farm work, it was impossible. A, I couldn't actually, I wasn't a farmer. So what I decided to do was um, I approached a butcher, Philip Warren, you know, who's in Lawston. Mm -hmm. So I approached him about 12 years ago with the idea of selling his meat into London, because um, I knew London. So he actually went for it and it was very hard for a couple of years, but within, you know, after 10 years, you know, we created a very strong business. I think they had like a four million pound turnover at the time. And over 10 years, we turned it up to about 12 million. Wow. Uh, and I'm going to answer some of the questions you said before, but but basically, you know, we sort of realised, because I was on the ground, I was actually doing all the deliveries myself for about six years. Um, we basically, I just got to know, because I was seeing chefs every single morning, I got to know the industry inside out, like from the bottom up, really. Every morning, you, you know, you'd see chefs at like six, seven, eight in the morning, got to know everyone. Mm -hmm. And we just started realising we just created a network of what we always said was we want to work with people who've got empathy. And the idea is we just got them and brought them down to Cornwall to meet us. And if we all got on, then we, we'd crack on, really. So I'll try and speed over that but then basically yeah. after about 12 years i actually ended up starting running food at pubs like the adam and eve we took over the food there in hobbiton and that went crazy and then i actually got my own pub with a business partner for two years the newman arms so i actually saw you know so i started getting used to the supply chain you know, i was quite a unique position where i knew all about the actual supply chain and then actually realized how hard it was to have a, a pub and a restaurant we actually put into liquidation after two years not my choice we were actually beginning to make money but 
I think, yeah, it was one of those things really. But then, but then I then lived in a houseboat for two years in London, which was quite cool. And during that stage, I just suddenly, I sort of forgot about the farming thing. I thought it was never going to happen. And then I just got, every morning I woke up on a houseboat and was surrounded by nature. And I started, um, it's quite funny, really. I just started, I just naturally went out every morning and just like checked all the animals. <laughs> like I was checking the ducks, the geese, like yeah. it was breeding season. I'd make sure how, you know, and I just started realizing what, you know, wait a minute, actually I'm, you know, I'm actually just, I think it's in my DNA really. I'm just checking, it's like you're a farmer really. Mm -hmm. So I then started, that's when I really started hitting with Gen Ag. So I got onto YouTube. I literally spent like two years locked up in a houseboat um, and just watched YouTube. And if I saw something interesting, I'd then, if I saw a farmer I thought was good, I'd actually drive off and go and see them. So it was an incredible two years. Mm -hmm. I still then didn't realize I was going to be farming. And then I just happened upon... So that was a kind of research and extended transition yeah. phase, kind of rediscovering yeah. your love of nature and the countryside yeah. and then kind yeah. of going from it was, yeah. city it like you, back, it to, back planned. to farmer. It, it, it was. It all sounds planned. It just wasn't. It was really... Yeah, it was quite a crazy thing. You know, I look back, you know, when you know, the chances of me actually living on a houseboat were weird. And then, because that was a friend of a friend. And then, yeah, it's just a weird time. You know, you look back and think, Christ, if that had not happened, I wouldn't be doing yeah. this now. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but then, yeah, it was just that... Yeah, so then I just, um, yeah, just somehow sort of contacted mum and said, look, I'm interested in, you know, well, actually, this uh, three, three uh, there's a breed of cow called the Red Ruby, like in North Devon, and it's what, you know, they're actually bred, you know, where our farm is in Devon, it's that, they're, you know, perfect for their ground, mm -hmm. and uh, someone offered me three of them from a nature reserve, so I contacted mum and said, look, I've got these three cows, can we put them on the land, and it was a yeah. way of me reconnecting with mum on the farming, and then, you know, and then through that, I, when we had the Adam and Eve, we actually started working with a guy who came up with the idea of fattening sheep, um, which nobody's done really. Okay. And it went down really well. So that was four years previously. And then, so I just suddenly thought about that again. And it's just remembered that, you know, I needed something where, which was fairly simple for me to get into farming and was actually profitable and had a quick, like, you know, good cash flow. You know, that's a killer of a lot of farm businesses setup costs and cash flow mm -hmm. um yeah so i just um i can talk all about that really but yeah so i know if I, just, I tend to do you ask one little question i, I go off on one really no but, no it's great yeah. it's great and you, you you touched on something a moment ago in terms of the kind of financial feasibility of the farm back in yeah. you know when we first joined the european union and, and maybe it's interesting just to talk about that very briefly because i think it's obviously very topical at the moment you know? yeah 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 what what were the what were the scenarios back in the seventies that caused those challenges? What in if you can summarize the last forty odd years, and then what do you, what's what's the reality in terms of what's happening on the ground now with you know exiting the European Union and the the, the subsidies that are going with that? Yeah, I suppose um you you know um I just remember growing up and it was all about butter mountains. You're probably too old to too young to remember that but it was everywhere so basically there was so much dairy happening in the um eu that there were these butter mountains and okay. it just became political that people were being subsidized to basically produce all these you know like basically so much milk that they had to then turn into butter and then store it but essentially you know i think the european union wanted certain areas to farm in certain ways um i think with us with the uk you know we were actually almost a victim of being too efficient really or too you know um but they sort of i think we were very much like right okay we're, we're probably the only real climate in, in europe that can grow arable so let's let the uk be arable and we'll, we'll encourage other areas to be livestock and dairy mm -hmm. so i think um but then really so basically you know i think in terms of subsidies and common agricultural policy they did you know try and nudge different countries to do their own thing and they didn't really want us to do livestock because they felt that was you know something that was you know i mean france has always been the i quite like the fact that their farmers are so they're, they've got a huge amount bigger um, they employ far more people in agriculture and uh, and they do if they if they if you annoy the french farmers they kick off pretty bloody quickly so i remember being yeah. in paris once and i was on the right. way somewhere i think i was on a wine trip i think i was going to burgundy or something and we we had a four or five hours in paris between trains and um yeah there was a there was a strike and there were yeah. twenty five thousand tractors yeah <laughs> doing loops of uh yeah of it's about, yeah paris which quite I mean, you talked about India earlier on. Maybe that's something to talk about is because that's obviously happened in India a lot. You know, I think the biggest strike that's ever happened has just happened in India. Yeah. It looks like the, the farmers going to get away. Um. So anyway, so that's. But then what really happened was that because um 
it's all part of the you know people given farmers are given money to become more efficient take down hedgerows um to plant ryegrass and basically ryegrass is very responsive to fertilizer so then they were encouraged to use chemical fertilizer and they're all encouraged to drain their land so it's only now that we realize that that's if you want to actually improve the soil that's the very worst thing you should do which i can talk about a bit later on mm. but basically what it meant was if you the more money you had the more efficient you could get and the more you know basically you could produce milk at a cheaper price um and then obviously the, the, i would say it was the birth of supermarkets that really changed things because they just wanted to you know they always use milk as a loss leader and they just wanted farmers to get more and more efficient to produce basically volume and not quality mm -hmm. um so and you know just meant that the smaller farmers just went out of business really or you know had to sell up or had to get bigger or just started buying up other farms um so that was yeah the writing was the wall for my my granddad's farm really um yeah so yeah it would be that's reliant amazing. on eu subsidies yeah to compensate for the fact that the farm couldn't stand on its own two feet yeah I mean, then actually no what else <laughs> happened with um i think yeah think about it now was then quotas came in so just as mum started a farm business, basically quotas came in where, say you were a certain size farm, you'd be given a quota for how much milk you could produce. So it was an EU-led thing. Yeah, actually, I'm trying to remember now. Just, you know, I was only about sort of 10 at the time, but obviously this is all conversations I remember, you know, because it was all, because yeah. it was such big stuff. Um, so quotas came in where you, you, could, you basically were given a quota. So basically you were allowed to, you know, you've got 35 cows, you can produce enough milk for 35 cows. And basically... That was actually became valuable because then you, if you wanted to farm, you had to buy a quota off someone else. So, you know, I want to farm 35 cows, right? I'm going to have to approach that other farmer. I'm basically, I'm going to buy his quota, and but he's not going to be able to farm. But then that meant that other farmer got money, and then, but they tended then to sort of retire. Mm. Um, so it just really meant that if you had money, you, you could start buying quota off people and start making your, your business bigger and other businesses smaller. I see. Um, so yeah, that's, that became one thing. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, if you want to set up a dairy business, you have to have a lot of money just to be able to actually be able to produce milk. <laughs> it's quite yeah, a strange thing. Yeah, yeah. even um, though it's potentially not profitable doing doing yeah. doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And then what about this next? So I mean, let's not get political, but I think in terms yeah. of what's happening now, for you particularly with your farm, are you seeing this as a as, a, as an opportunity, or is it another another? obstacle to overcome that um, there will be a withdrawal I, of EU subsidies. I think my my best mate is a is a probably one of the country's best sports psychologists. Um we both went to comprehensive in Lordston in Cornwall. Um but he's gone on to do very good things. But he always says I'm an absolute natural optimist. That's my probably my one of my most positive things that I always see on the bright side, but it's also one of my negatives. But for me actually you know, I think if we didn't have joint, if we, you know, we're still able to sell to Europe, which is if we hadn't had that, I think, but I, I actually never think that was going to happen anyway. I just think, you know, that was always going to go to the last minute. And so I think with that, now we'd be in huge trouble. Um, me personally, um, I've said for three years that I think it's maybe a bit different now. So when, when Trump was in, which I know he's still in, but he's not going to be for much longer. I think he was very close to Boris and I think they were basically going to let America swamp the UK with, very cheap produce and i still think that might happen you know um i've said that what there is a revolution happening in farming but i personally think it's going to take 10 years for us to sort the supply chain get everywhere you know we need a 10-year gap so i've i've basically gone along the opinion that you know we probably need to look for overseas markets to actually look after the, this type of farming you know so and then consolidate and then you know because it's very important that we try and keep those small farmers in place give them business but i think we need 10 years of finding overseas markets to keep those you know get those farmers going and then you know consolidate and then have been a bit more of a position of power in 10 years so what, yeah. what percentage of the of the, the produce or the, the livestock that you're rearing goes out of the uk i mean no I me mean, no no personally we you know so i because we have such a strong restaurant contacts i sell i, I basically sell to philip warren butcher and then mm -hmm. we sell to restaurants yeah. um and it's you know we built a business you know i came with this idea of fattening sheep and it's just the quality of the product is just far better i knew it'd be good because everything if you look logically how you produce really good meat like fattening old sheep is actually how you would do it mm. um but it was actually far better than i actually thought you know like you know i it, the first sort of sheep we killed and sold we sold it to jeremy chan at Akui, and he already you know compared it to wagyu and mm. um, ibirico um and so like that was i was like oh right 
so that's that was our first lot so you know as i prove my farming methods and my buying we can just you know how good we can make this i just don't yeah. know it's, it's it's pretty it's pretty exciting um so yeah but obviously so we were we started selling probably up to about 20 sheep a week to restaurants which was pretty crazy in the first year and then obviously restaurants totally shut down um but then luckily we sort of came up with the idea of getting the restaurants to help us use their social media presence to help us you know so so we set up something called on the pass with the warrens yeah um and then we built up a a very i mean it's, it's quite i mean i would i can I, at the time i had to keep my mouth shut really but in some ways it was actually very good for my own business that the lockdown happened i'm smiling i feel a bit awkward saying it but because it meant that then we focused on like a home market mm -hmm. so we basically i don't think there's anything there. wrong with being happy about finding a new route through <laughs> yeah, you know, what's was... gone on last year and i loved i loved what you guys did with on the past because it was almost putting kind of supplier restaurant and uh consumer kind of all in the same really in yeah. the same yeah. room if you like and using the restaurant's reputation and the restaurant's audience yeah. to, 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 to kind of pull the product through, which I thought yeah. was intentionally well, um, otherwise really clever. Which because I basically when it first happened, like the Warrens probably had so much meat hanging. Because you know, say with Brat, we supply them, you know, we age everything for about five or six weeks to Brat. We probably have like 20 sirloin, ho sirloin, 20 ho rib a week for them. You imagine you times that by six, that's a lot of meat. Yeah. Um, and but I actually I actually went back to my publishing past. I remember because we basically would, I'd found a couple of contacts in London to sell to butchers because obviously butchers were still open. Um, and it was when I was driving along up there, you know, lockdown had just, to be honest, what actually happened was I was, I'm a bit of a YouTube man, as, as you're probably aware. <laughs> and I started watching this guy. There was a podcast where, well, it was actually a YouTube sort of stroke podcast where they were interviewing doctors in, in Italy. You remember how it was Italy that was affected first. And this was like three or four weeks before we locked down. And I was watching this and it was like, I could see, you know, they were interviewing doctors who were in the middle of the pandemic in Italy, and it was like, holy moly, this is this is going to hit us. So, mm -hmm. I, and I probably got onto that more than more quickly than anyone else, really. And I was like, so I got my brain working then, and I remember yeah. going back to my publishing past, and I worked for a newsletter publisher for a while, and their business was all about newsletter. It was all about well, probably what you're doing now. It's all about database management. So basically, you need to get a massive great database in place, and then that helps your business. And then that just made me go on to think. Right, okay, well, if we, you know, we don't really need a database because you've got all these chefs and restaurants who've got, you know, massive data, you know, like social media followings. Sure. And I came up with the idea almost like two weeks before it happened. So when it happened, it was awful for my butcher, you know, because you had to, it was just terrible. But in my mind, I'm like, I actually think I've got this sorted. <laughs> so I just had oh. to stay away for a week, let them do their stuff. Yeah. And then a week later, I went to him and said, look, like, I think I, we can, I think we can ship this meat. You know, we just need to approach all the restaurants we work with. Mm. I think they'll support we create we developed the website in two days and then sort of flipped it really and it was it was pretty you know i look back it was crazy because i was actually driving up what i come up with the idea i was actually driving up to london when they launched it yeah. i was driving and obviously like my phone's there and I, I didn't want to be able to touch my phone but it was all beeping and going crazy so <laughs> I, was, I was swapping over every half hour checking on notifications yeah you saw it was like you know it, it was a big whatsapp group and it was like because we didn't know if it worked and then after now we'd so, like say i think like I think it was um, Smoky Goat were the first ones to do it, to, you know, and it was like, and it just went crazy. And we're like, oh, you know, you like, you sort of know it's going to work, but what it does, you're like, man, this is crazy. You know, it's, it's brilliant. It was quite exciting. But. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it sounds amazing. Well, you've clearly, you've, you've, I hate this word, pivoted very well. And, you know, yeah. Um, hopefully you're in a great position to, you know, because I, I think. But it's still you know, really hard. I mean, I wouldn't say great. It's still really, really hard. You know, it's. And every day you have to push, but there's so many people behind the scenes helping me. I, I might mention one. There's a question you're asking later on. I think, and I might, you know, there's some people behind the scenes who are helping massively. Yeah. You know, it's a yeah. real, you know, there's a massive, a lot of people have come together to just help each other. And some of us aren't earning money for, you know, it's just a, it's been quite, yeah, pretty cool like that. So it's certainly not, yeah. I mean, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of hidden hands as I call them, right. <laughs> as, as as there often is with these yeah. with these yeah. things. Um, let's chat about Veganuary. Um, you know, and as, as we said just before this, you know, I, I've gone down this kind of rabbit hole for the last yeah. week or so looking at that and, the, you know, the Ethical Butchers Regenuary campaign, which I can't see really as being a, a, a bad thing as far as I, as, as, as far as I'm kind of, you know, understanding at the moment. So do, do you want to just give me a very brief kind of your perspective on this argument, if you like, in terms yeah. of 
there, there, there's this polarization that's emerged yeah, between true. hardcore vegans yeah. and, and, and the kind of regen approach. <laughs> what, are, what are your what are your thoughts on that? And then where does your farm sit uh, in, yeah. in terms of how regenerative and the kind of principles and practices that you deploy? Yeah, I, one thing I'd ask you is because um, I'm sort of I'm now doing it. I've been I've read about it for two years, and now I'm actually doing it. And like when you actually do it, honestly, after you just it works. So I'm sort of so into it now. I'm almost at that point where like. I forget that other people is, they've never really come across it. So can I ask, like, did you, is this like, was was this the first time you sort of came across the regenerative sort of farming movement because of January? Was that so, it's only... Yeah, yeah. You know. I mean, I, I, I knew it existed. Um, yeah. I understood the broad strokes. I had already seen Kiss the Ground um, yeah. Not yeah, okay. came out whenever that was. And I kind of thought, okay, I get it. But, you know, you watch these things on Netflix and they're not necessarily taken in context, you know, because yeah, yeah, no, with game changers and that says something else. So yeah, I've, yeah, I've been yeah, like, I think... yeah, okay, I get that. But, you know, and, and, and then they put yeah. it in the back of my mind. And so this actually then led to a, a bit of, a, yeah, as I said last week, going down this rabbit hole, almost a bit of an yeah. obsession of trying to work yeah. out where I stand on the thing. Yeah. Because yeah. You know, I'm an omnivore. I love meat. Um, my yeah. my housemate and my dad are both vegan. My girlfriend's vegetarian. So I, I I've always been pulled in different directions depending on the yeah. company that I'm in. Um, I mean, it's sort of um. I mean, first of all, it's just a funny point. Like when like Game Changers came out, like it was just and I think it was the um what was the other one um oh, the one that was really oh conspiracy conspiracy like all the stats in conspiracy were just nonsense, you know, they, and they admitted afterwards that they just totally faked all the stats. So like, I spent like a year saying, don't watch Netflix. If you watch Netflix, don't believe anything they say, you know, don't ignore all the documentaries. And then obviously Kiss the Grime came out and I was like, but believe this one, this is true. I just funny. <laughs> I was like, you can go back to so watching Netflix. That kind of yeah. self out there, there's that kind of it's like confirmation after the fact, isn't yeah, there? When you yeah. can find, if you look hard enough, you can find stuff to support yeah. your beliefs, which is dangerous yeah. in a way. But like, yeah, I just find it funny though. Like, um, no, um, so no, see, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, it's just interesting to find your viewpoint. So, when I first discovered Regen Ag, it was actually there's a chap called Alan Savory, who's a bit of a you know, like a 75 year old Zimbabwean guy, um, really odd past. Um, but he's the first person who came across this idea of, like, we, you know, we might even need more ruminants. You know, if you, you know, if you've got ruminants, they, you know, do it in the right way. They can sequester carbon, and and there's that famous phrase, the famous phrase where, if it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. And I was like, right, okay, well, obviously I want this to be true, but it's got to be nonsense. Um, so that's like, you know, so I don't know if it was your first thought. It's like, this can't be true. They just, you know, this must be the meat industry just trying to make me feel good about eating meat. But then. So yeah, it's just interesting to get your viewpoint. So it's good that you went down a rabbit hole and discovered it. Um, yeah. So in terms of um, where I sit at the moment, right, first and foremost, and this isn't me just being marketing, we've got nothing to hide from what the way we farm. We've always, you know, the way, the way we source our meat, you know, it's as natural as you, get, you can get. I mean, down in Cornwall, for example, the topography is such that the, there, isn't, you can't, there isn't the ground and there isn't the topography to do like arable farming. And it's arable farming, once you start doing that is when you start, you know, damaging the ground. Um, so we've always said that we're actually thankful to the vegan community for like highlighting the difference between farming. I absolutely detest factory farming and I, I spend every day trying to coexist farming because I think we need to get animals out of factories and on the fields. I think particularly the way we treat pigs and chickens is just absolutely, I mean, it's inhumane and it's like, so, and also with cows, you know, the fact that, you know, you're taking cows from a system like dairy system mainly and then fattening them in feedlots. Again, you know, and you're u using, um, you know, like maybe soya from the, you know, rainforest and things to fatten those animals. That's abhorrent, you know, it's like, so So we, we the, with the vegan group, they're actually highlighting the fact that there are different farming methods. So we've actually always viewed that as a good thing. Um, my sort of stance is, um, I think the vegan community, there's quite a few things really, um, which is where I get quite deep, not, you know, but, like, I think when you actually farm and you see what ruminants do, like they are geared up to get stuff that we can't digest and turn it into a digestible format. And for me, it's pretty obvious that our, we've been linked with ruminants since, you know, since we, you know, got, you know, wherever we came from, you know, um, as we've progressed as a 
as a being, we've done it alongside ruminants and these animals that are able to, you know, um, eat things that we can and then put into a form that we can, you know, so obviously whether that's dairy or, or meat. Um, but then when you actually farm, when you see what ruminants actually do, it's just, and then you start thinking the wider picture, it's just obvious that like they're absolutely essential for basically transforming the soil you know they've they've been here for millions of years working with nature and nature's basically works with ruminants and it's ruminants that kick start all of like the soil mm. really mm. so for me like the the vegan movement i mean i'm sort of like wobbling around it a bit but i sort of started to re regen ag and i was you know thinking and i, I always felt bad about it. I, I always debated with vegans you know during that two-year boat stage I've, I debated everyone quite robustly on Twitter. But I just basically wanted to learn the arguments. And I basically, you know, and during that, you, I did have a lot of aggression from the vegan community. And they're fairly, the, the online ones are fairly sort of angry. I'm not mm -hmm. saying your, your dad is or anything, but... Um, yeah, I spoke then, to Ben at the Ethical Butcher and, you know, he's got death threats. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I've had that, you know, like, um, mm -hmm. you, know, we've, you know, that's the thing. I would say, like... That's but you know we we're, we're quite emotive because I think farmers were really basically we're really scared to actually stand up to vegans because you knew if you if you got into a debate with one then it was probably going to end well best case scenario they would block you but worst case yeah they'd start threatening you and they do they do tend to pile on to the people who are sort of at their lowest ebb like as a, I'm not going to say her name but as a young girl she's 18 I think her mum had died previously and then her dad had died later on she had to take over the dairy farm and you could you know like it's 18 year old girl wow. and like. You know, she sort of announced it on Twitter. You could tell she was, you know, and then basically the, the vegan online community just piled on and basically really attacked this guy. And it was like, oh, man, you know, these yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's the extreme and the fringe, isn't it? And I think it's, you know, it's like what's happening in the US with Trump. There's well, always think, those, yeah. you know, there's always those. I don't things. know. I think my, my issue with the vegan community now is the bit that changed my life. And, um, you know, when you meet someone and you're like, you're, probably the smartest person i've ever met a friend of a friend said you need to go and see this i'm not going to say her name again this is, this is the trouble with if you start saying people's names and then people watch this you're really worried that they then get might get attacked i mean that's the that's sort of what we're up against really um so you have to you have to sort of take my word for it but she's maybe a french lady based in cornwall um and she's basically studied a phd in brain function and nutrition and she's actually been in the field actually looking after people for two or three years so i went and met her and at that stage i was like you know you sort of naturally just think you know maybe we're not right with this farming method you know vegans okay and she basically sat me down and said right she said i've been just now actually treating vegans for three years she said i'm mostly treating teenage vegan girls um they're all suffering from the glutamate deficiency mm. and glutamate interestingly enough is the amino acid and it's actually the um oh, what's it called um umami so the your flavor umami you've got a taste buds in your mouth on your tongue that are geared up for umami mm. umami is the, the actual amino acid and it's called glutamate and that's and glutamate. Glutamate in msg but the natural that the, the, the is added to food to provide that yeah if, yeah 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 so yeah you obviously add it to food to you know because your taste bud wants it and it knows it's good for you you know that's the whole thing when you study sheep like i do you know that sheep can naturally know what's good for them and if they're unwell they can actually self-select which plants to make them better and i don't think the humans are any different we've probably lost it a little bit but for some reason we've got a receptor on our tongue that needs glutamate and that obviously in my mind means that's basically because we probably need it um, but she said basically glutamate is vital for the transfer of information between cells particularly brain function and she said we're, we're sitting on a ticking time bomb of how particularly vegan girls they're encouraged to go vegan at an early age um, you know whether that's linked to eating disorders or body image you know it's almost like a fix all if i go vegan i'm going to lose weight and it's like it's and then ethically it's a really good thing to do because i'm saving the planet you know it's quite a strong argument yeah, um, yeah. but she did say she said we were sitting on a ticking time bomb and she said if you go vegan she reckons like 10 percent of the world population has got the dna to actually be able to thrive on a vegan diet but she said 90 percent of people just can't and they, they will need supplements but she said just because something contains something doesn't mean your body can absorb. She just said, she, did, she said, people don't need to eat, eat meat necessarily, but she said, we need to get people eating dairy from a grass-based system. If we don't, then, you know, there's going to be huge problems. And she linked it to like, you know, if your brain's not working properly, I just think you're far more susceptible to messages. And this is a time when, when I grew up, 
you know if we wanted to get information we had to read a book um or pick up a newspaper now you don't now everything is on your the whole all the information is on your fingertips and you're being yeah. hit by algorithms and you're being hit by you know all sorts and and i think social media is designed to make us polarized and at the time when you need your brain working the best i would say you know encouraging people to go on a diet that lacks glutamate means you put your brain's probably working the least so so what i fear is with the vegan movement is i think how can you criticize someone who doesn't want to kill animals i mean i have to kill like 10 or 20 a week and you know i can just it doesn't get any easier and in some ways if i didn't have to you know but but so yeah i think so, that's yeah. what i'm trying to do here is almost isolate those various different arguments because yeah. you're right if your justification for going vegan is because you can't handle the thought of an animal being killed then almost there is yeah. no argument you know that's that's yeah. that, that's that's your choice and i don't think anybody can disagree yeah with yeah that. What I found quite alarming and also being a kind of brand strategist is, is looking at Veganuary's position and this, you know, the statements that are up there front and centre on their website that, that directly link going vegan with being yeah. better for you and better for the planet. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And it's just, yeah. Substitutes are better yeah. for you and better for yeah. the planet. Yeah. And then yeah. if you then go a little bit further and start looking at a Beyond Meat Burger versus a beef burger, yeah. there's probably yeah. not much in it. And I think if anything, a beef a, a Beyond Meat Burger has more sodium um, and, and, and a carbohydrate content that the meat doesn't have. But that for me is only two sides of the argument because there's yeah. a third side to the argument, which is that if you're doing veganuary for health reasons, then there's a third, yeah. thing, which is make your own vegan burger out of yeah. you know, things in your kitchen that aren't processed, yeah. that haven't been shipped yeah. from California, yeah. you know, that include beans and pulses or whatever else. Yeah. It, it, they're not presenting a holistic Absolutely, yeah. And I think yeah. that position is really dangerous because yeah. what's really clear is a badly researched vegan diet is much worse for yeah. you than a well-researched omnivorous so I have a fundamental yeah. issue, morally, yeah. but also from a comms point of view, that that message yeah. isn't actually responsible. And yeah. there is probably, as as Glenn said, you know, veganuary regenerary should agree on ninety five percent of yeah. the argument. So there probably might be a need to 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 to, to work together. Yeah, um, no, I think actually, I mean, that's really interesting. It's um, it's very obvious when I grew up. Right, go back to like 20 or 30 years ago. Nestle were the devil. Yeah. Nestle were basically selling baby milk to developing world, and it was basically doing them great harm. And so I grew up hating Nestle. And then I think about five years ago, the chairman of Nestle came out and said, like, drink, only drinking water isn't a human right. Everyone should be paying for it. You know, they're not nice people. But then I started seeing all the vegan community like celebrating the fact that Nestle had 800 vegan products and all these. And I was like, what's happened to the world where like Nestle aren't a nice company, but all these vegans are celebrating the fact that Nestle, you know, so, so basically and it was all processed food. And it just became very obvious to me that there is like the corporate takeover of the vegan food movement. And these corporate companies, are, it's definitely in their interest to not have meat and dairy because it's more you know, expensive to produce. It's in their interest to produce stuff on, you know, mass monoculture systems, get it all into a big vat, mix it together and then sell it. It's yeah. quite clearly that's what's happening. So they're almost using these people, you know, they're pretty, and I don't think it's fine if that was actually true. And it was, you know, and it was saving the planet. But quite clearly, once you put stuff into monoculture and the whole reason, like, I mean, I think the people in Impossible Burgers have said, I mean, I think their growth forecast was very, very optimistic. But they said that if we um, if we, you know, want to keep up with our targets, we're going to use soy. Um, we it's going to have to be GM soy. We can't source it organically. So for us to do what we want to do, it's all got to be GM. And the reason you do GM is so that you've got a plant that grows, and you then you nuke it with chemicals, kill everything around it, and then that grows. And that's yeah. not the very work that we should be doing. So yeah, so mm. so I think I think like with all this sort of thing, it is about polarizing people, isn't it? And I think for the corporations, the last thing they want is vegans and regen ag people to actually come together. So I think what you're seeing is the beginnings of a fight back from the corporate company who's got, they have got huge, huge money. Like I think yeah. Bill Gates has invested heavily, but Branson's invested heavily. Social media platforms have invested heavily. Um, the Guardian, for example, being paid like quite a few million quid to actually promote 
plant-based channel four for example has actually invested multi-millions of pounds into a plant-based company like a lot of the media people have you know have got invested interests um and i think veganuary i'd love to know who actually um supports you know who actually sponsors it yeah so i think they've got, they've we're not got very careful fair, um, they've got a fair celebrity following and lots of endorsements yeah, so, um, yeah it, 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 it is it is interesting so let's uh let's talk briefly about um about regenerative agriculture in principle yeah. just a very brief introduction to actually what it means as as a first point and then if, if we understand the fundamentals of it what needs to happen for its kind of wholesale adoption yeah. in a way or, or or at least the beginnings of a of, 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 of an adoption and uh, I, yeah. I talked to somebody um, who runs a sustainability consultancy, and you know, one of her points of view is around labelling. And she said, you know, we've had we've had the traffic light system on packaging for a long time in terms of uh, you know uh, the, the kind of health of, of, of products, and we need a similar thing for yeah. uh, the land and the animals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, a brief a brief intro to regen farming would be brilliant, and then then okay. how, how um, people feel that, that, so I, that everything needs to yeah. change so that it can become a the, the the planet saving and the carbon sequestering um yeah thing well, i think um, to. so to basically it's what it, it's what the way regen is basically what, the way that we've always farmed up until about 40 or 50 years ago and i think it's important to mention say indigenous cultures because you know uh, you know they were all the indigenous cultures around the world everybody's learned to farm in a way that looks after nature they wouldn't have known why um, so it's very important to look at the role that, you know, the, the world has created cultures that are, you know, around, you know, balancing, producing food with the environment. It's only about, you know, just the last 40 or 50 years where we've sort of changed that. So I think Regina, Ag, as soon as you add chemicals to the soil, so if you add, say, fertiliser, it destroys all the microorganisms in the soil and it basically stops them working. And once you do that, um, you basically the ability to hold water, the ability, you know, just the store starts, store starts working. So for me, Regen Ag, wherever you've got a soil that's been hit hard by chemical advertising, you know, agriculture, pesticides, fertilizer, that soil is not working. So Regen Ag to me is how you get that soil from that state to actually make it start working again. Um, so I think it's that simple, really. And the way you obviously need to do it, to feed a soil, you need to feed it carbon basically and the ways you can feed it carbon are either through photosynthesis with you know going through the plants or when the actual plant dies worms come up grab the plant and they pull it down under so you basically to get it working you need you know worms need to have access to the actual plants and you need things you know plants growing to get carbon dioxide and it's very obvious that the most nature has come up with the best way of doing that which is ruminants so if you look at the bison um, before, you know, sort of European settlers came along, bison were in their millions and mm. they had a system where they were just moving along because they had predators. The bison were out of migration. And this is what Alan Savy was talking about was, you know, if you, what you want is, say you've got grass that long, it's really this simple. You want, what modern farming has done is put loads of chemicals. I mean, if I explain what, say with my system, put explains it. So the dairy farm, my granddad's dairy farm, was in a very, very wet place in Devon, between Bobbinmoor and Devon, De um, Dartmoor. So the rain comes in, goes over Bobbinmoor, and then just <laughs> before it gets to Dartmoor, it just plunges. So basically, it's probably one of the wettest farms in the country. Yeah. So, that it would, but over time, they would have used, the soil would have been able to, if, you know, if you've got all the um, microbiology working, soil can hold water. So basically, what during the um, sort of farming revolution, when it was like Feed the Nation, I mean, my granddad would have had native animals on there. He would have been farming in a way where small fields, he would have been moving around regularly. He wouldn't know why they were doing it, but it would have, you know, over time, they wouldn't have had the chemical analysis. They wouldn't have had the, the science to understand why it's working, but they just, they knew over time what it did. But suddenly he was like, right, okay, take them out of the hedgerows, make your fields bigger, take away all of the plant up and then plant ryegrass. So ryegrass is very shallow rooting, but it responds really quickly to chemical fertilizer. And basically, if you put chemical fertilizer, the ryegrass grows really quickly, mm -hmm. produces huge volume, but it crowds everything else out. So, you know, so as soon as it, the land's dry, put the fertilizer down, it grows really quickly. They also drain the fields. So rather than let nature absorb the water, they just drained it. So all, it rained, the water went straight off. And then you just basically you were only dealing with the very surface top of the soil. So you've got a system where, uh, you know, with a very short space of time, 
the soil out completely and utterly can't hold water. And there's no, there's no, you're not putting any sort of like carbon back into that system. And you're then really you're this vicious cycle where you need to use yeah. more chemicals to, yeah. it's to, like, to produce you, the same yields. Yeah. It's only now, you know, I mean, the hardest thing for me, because my granddad, you know, I get very emotional when I even think about him, you know, I see the graveyard every day. Um, hardest working person I've ever met. Like just, and you, he had a dairy farm. And you just can't, a person couldn't work harder. Um, but what, what, I, trying to accept that I, I basically hadn't farmed, came back because I'd read all this stuff and met all these people. Mm. I sort of knew what had gone wrong with the farm and he'd obviously passed away. And as a, yeah, and it was, um, but trying to, in my head, think like that guy worked so hard, did everything that was asked of him, produced a huge volume of milk for the land, changed his land so it could accept it, but it was all wrong. And he, Mm. He basically, my granddad would either be, I spoke to mum like, you know, so length. His granddad was never, you know, he'd come in for like, he actually used to be able to be able to come in for a five minute nap. He'd be up at 5.30, be out died all day, milk the cows in the morning and the evening. And then he'd be out doing stuff all day. Um, and then he would come in for a fight. He had the ability just to sleep for five minutes and crack on, which actually I can do, but I, I sleep for about two hours sometimes. In the yeah, I'd, be out, out. I'd be out for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, no, I do. I have a bit of a siesta in the summer, which I, I think, well, my age, I'm 48 now, so I think I need it. But, um, but basically, I said, what was he doing? So to, when he wasn't milking cows, he said normally he was basically looking after the drainage around the fields to make sure the water had access. So basically, because of the water he'd been, and he wouldn't have known why, but, you know, if you're going to have drainage, you need to make sure that everything's clear around. If you have, like, you have pipes working through the fields, and then you have, like, around the boundary, you have a ditch. So basically, the water... If it rains, it then finds the pipes and then shoots out, yeah. and, you know, leaves the field. But obviously, the more he put chemical fertilizer on, the less water it could take and the more the water was coming out. So basically, you know, he was sort of spending his life having to work so hard and he wouldn't have known at the time. It's because he'd put all these chemicals on and yeah. he was farming in such yeah, a way that was yeah. like trying to... And trying so to in your, way, life, your, your legacy is almost, or his legacy has been passed to you and you're almost, if I can use the... the, the yeah. Undoing, yeah, it is, and it, he, yeah, and it, uh, he, he, he unknowingly, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and it almost uh, honestly, it makes me, land. yeah. I mean, I when I say this, I do sometimes cry, you know, it's so like I just know how hard he worked, and but you know, you try and the person you respect most in the world who worked like an absolute dog. I went to London and was, you know, very like had quite a lot of fun for quite a long time, possibly not as uh. Well, you know, then for me to come back and in my head even try and think that he wasn't doing right and I can do it better, it's just a, it's a really awful thought. But you know, it's it's true, really. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah so, so what? Yeah, so um, so regenerative yeah. agriculture is all about restoring soil health, which in yeah. turn means you need to use less uh, or fewer inputs. Um, yeah, yeah. And then also, there's this carbon sequestration, as as Kiss the Ground yeah. says, there's a thousand gigatons yeah. of excess carbon which we need to deal with. Yeah. even if we stopped yeah. emissions today. So yeah. the future is um, farms that are uh, encouraging biodiversity, using animals in the right way to maintain soil health as part of an ecosystem. Yeah. Does that inevitably mean that we all need to eat less meat? Um, there seems to be this thing now. I think farmers are going along with it, but no, I actually, I don't. Hmm. I think, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 48. You know, got myself fairly unfit, come back to farming. I drink four pints of organic home meat, milk a day and I eat a lot of meat because my body's like, I need this because I'm working really hard and I'm, you know, so... I from think, an environmental point of view? Um, no, I think, like, so what I think is, this is what I'm... Um, I did a little bit of work for Friends of the Earth in Northern Ireland and um, got to know them quite well. And the way we're actually... There's a real issue in Northern Ireland where we've got a lot of chicken factories, a lot of pig factories, and they're going out. And it's almost like we're offshoring. And this is a bit of a thing for the world, you know, we're offshoring a lot of our nonsense to Northern Ireland and they're, I think 80% of their rivers are actually polluted. And this, this sort of shows you that if we're going to get, all we're going to do, if we, we change the way we do things, we're going to offshore all the problems to other countries and then we're going to, you know, so, but anyway, I would say the future to me, the, what I'm doing at the moment, I've got a small farm. I need to go for that higher end market because I need to get a decent price. However, where the revolution should and can happen is with arable and basically like 40 years ago this is what they did anyway but 
the future to me, there's a chap called Fred Price. Um, he works for, he's got a farm called Gothenley Farm. Um, it's about 200, 250 acres. Um, Fred, like probably about 31, 32 now, just again, one of those people who's really super smart. Um, first I came across it was that Tom Adams, who owns Coombs Head, puts in touch with Fred. Fred needed to sell Tamworth pigs, and that's all we knew. So and he needed to sell to keep, you know, he was trying this new farming method. He needed to sell um, a few a week. So I was asked to try and find a market. So basically we connected him with um, the Super 8 group, which is, you know, at that time, I think they just had Kiln. And uh, well, Kiln was about to open and they had Smoking Goat. the original Smoking Goat on Denmark Street. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. yeah. so it was at yeah. that time. So, but yeah, so, um, so obviously I've known him for years. We worked really, really closely with them. So we got them taking it. And then, like, I found it quite interesting. So I actually then thought, right, I'm going to go and meet Fred, this farmer in Somerset. And as soon as I saw what he was doing, it was like, and at that stage, I didn't actually know what a change bag was. I saw my friend Michael Harrison, who actually now works at Super 8, had come across it in Australia. And he told me about this amazing thing where there was like, they had sheep and then the sheep would leave and then they'd have chickens. And it didn't really sink in. But I was like, and then when I saw what Fred was doing, I was like, oh shit, this is what Michael was talking about. Um, this is Regen Ag. So basically, Fred had um, gone to university. I think he went to Oxford or Cambridge. Came back and said, well, I want to be a farmer um, to his parents. And they were horrified because they're like, they knew farming was really difficult. Like they, Nobody wanted their kids to do it because they just know how, you know how difficult it was. He's like, no, I'm going to do it. So he basically, he was producing um, wheat and it was um, totally chemical. And he was, his yields, what he, he just learned how to become a brilliant, brilliant chemical farmer, which is, you know, that's what he did. So he was basically looking at the science of it, putting more chemicals on. He was finding his yield was going up but he was actually spending more money. So the profit was staying the same. So he was obviously putting more and more input. I mean, you mentioned input earlier on, which is very interesting. But he um, was putting more and more inputs on. The yield was going up. So, so he was doing his job, you know, yield, yield, yield. But his basic, his, his, his profit was, so he was getting more in debt to the bank. You know, he's paying more, you know, it was more, it was just, you know, it was really stressing out. And then one year, he did everything right, but the yield just collapsed. Like hardly, he just grew at far less um, wheat than he'd normally done. And he just realised that his soil was basically just stopped working. You know, it comes to the point where all that chemical stuff, it just meant that the soil had nothing left to give. So that's when he just got, really got into, you know, the soil and how you rebuild it. Yeah, because yeah. so I heard he we lose globally a, a, a piece of land the size of the United Kingdom every year. It just becomes completely useless. Yeah. So people, people, people move on. Yeah. Um, so just to say on the Fed thing, so to, to give you optimism, Fed basically now get, takes 20 acres out, plants like 36 different plants like a you know a herbal lay and then he actually grazes it with tamworths so for me like i did when i worked in the north i'm trying to connect it now like um so when i did a little bit of research in northern ireland friends of the earth i just looked at fed system and he basically produces a certain amount of pork from his system and basically his input is actually making money on so rather than pay for chemicals his pigs are the ones that are actually acting as the fertilizer and because we've set up a supply chain He's actually making money from that input. But I worked out some sums, and this is me very much like on the back of a piece of paper. But I worked out that if 20% of our arable farmers in the UK, at the moment, we've got 9 million pigs in factories, you know, which is horrific. And God knows how many chickens. So my, I sort of worked out that if 20% of arable farmers in the UK use Fred system, then that would need 9 million pigs. We could take all the pigs that are currently in factories and actually put them on the land, regenerating it. So it's, and then you could then like, for example, now like we've got, mo you can have a mobile dairy system. So you can set up mobile, you know, we've got the technology now where you can just plonk, you, you, you could basically put cows into a regenerative system, arable, could put a cover crop or a herbal lay, milk those cows, move a dairy system, you know, the milk parlor to their, where they are, milk them and then sell that milk so for me the the revolution has to happen in the arable sector because that and it, it's just it's obvious the most obvious thing in the world like no one's really talking about it but you know if 20 percent of the people change the way they farm then there'd be no chemicals and all the pigs in the factory and then you can actually put chickens as part of that system mm -hmm. this is what i mean where i think we need to buy time for 10 years i need to find a market for regen ag people worldwide because the uk just isn't geared up for it yet get them doing it and then let the supply chain take over you know you can't just create a supply chain overnight you need to get one you know where fred is you need the next farm doing what he's doing and then the next farm you know you can't if fred does it 
transport-wise, you picking up from Fred and then somewhere else is just impossible if it's miles and apart. You need the demand, which is a result of education, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but also, but also, I think it's the price. At the moment, the price will be high, but if, when we start doing the sums, if we, I think we'll one day we'll work out that at the moment, like five years ago, Fred would have spent tens of thousands of pounds on chemicals. Now he's not, but now he's actually making money from the pigs. Can we talk farmers into, you know, selling their meat for not too much if it's really healthy and good for you and good for the soil? Because they know that they're saving money. You know, they, they almost, Arab will almost need to support what the areas like mine need to produce animals that are really healthy and native and then get the farmers to buy them and then pay those farmers a fair price to get everything connected, really. Yes, yeah, so that's my, would be my overall plan. So hope that makes sense. It makes, it makes perfect sense. And so that's really interesting. Um, in terms of the kind of, we, we, we mentioned this kind of just, just before, and we've been going for a while, but we've, we've got five more minutes or so. You were talking about uh, in, in this, this interesting um, the kind of link potentially that you see emerging between kind of fashion and farming. Yeah. That they both kind of share equal responsibility for, for being terrible on the planet at the moment. And, and, and actually, if you look at, I look at my own behavior, where do I have the most impact at the moment, given I'm not flying anywhere? And, you know, yeah. it's in the choices I make in my purchasing, which at the moment is predominantly food and yeah. a little bit of, you know, needs, needs some new t shirts, whatever it might be. So let's, let's maybe finish by just talking a little bit about, um, about how you can see the two industries working together yeah. and what for what gain yeah it was a lady called um alice robinson she i mean when i met her she's probably about 25 26 um and she did a the victoria and albert museum did a um, big show on like the future trends of food and she actually she's a fashion designer um she basically realized in fact she actually comes from a farming background her dad was a vet um and she just realized that when she started using fabric she had no idea where the fabric was coming from and particularly leather and wool and she just realised that, you know, what the hell is going on? Like in food, people need to, you know, the people are starting to look at where the food's coming from. But in fashion, it was impossible, like just impossible. So she sort of, I suddenly got in touch with her and I followed her story for the last two or three years. And it's just obvious that, like, yeah, fashion has got, you know, there. I mean, if you, you know, look at their carbon footprint, and everything's happening, it is horrendous. But they are beginning to look at it. So, for example, um, Patagonia, They've started, they've actually got like four broad principles of Regen Ag. So they're only sourcing from Regen Ag. Um, there's a lady called Sarah Moa, who's like one of the most influential fashion people in the world. She like votes for mm. American Vogue. I like, somehow got to know her and there's a lady called Phoebe English in this country. There's a real drive for these young designers to actually suddenly like, where are we getting our fashion from? Where are we actually sourcing it from? And basically, you know, there's a few influential people in the fashion press who are now beginning to work with farmers. And I think that's just really strong movement. And you imagine if two industries actually start working together like that, you know, like, so what Alice is doing is she's, you know, unbelievable, like, you know, quite, you know, sort of, um, I don't know, she's, you know, you come across and you wouldn't think it's like it, but what she's doing at the moment is she's actually contacting abattoirs. She goes to abattoirs herself, you know, trying to source skins from native animals and then basically put them into a food, you know, the change. So she's actually linking up with, um, there's an organization called Pasture for Life who, you know, they are you know, interesting. You mentioned labeling earlier on. They're trying to, you know, label that, you know, grass fed means grass fed. Alice is now working with them. They're possibly going to get mobile abattoirs to be able to go to people, collect their skins, and then link that to fashion. How, you know, so basically, there's something it's, I think it's like fairly early on, but I know how driven Alice is. You know, we you know, a chap called Brett Graham, who's a, you know, the head chef of the, or the owner of the Lebri, mm. probably the most driven man I've ever met in my life. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Alice is probably the, Alice is probably the only person I've ever met who's on a par with Brett, mm -hmm. who's that driven. You know, nothing's ever going to stop Brett. So yeah. when I met Alice, I'm like, so you just know nothing's going to stop that girl. You know, so like what happens at the moment if a, if if a sheep goes into an abattoir, what happens with 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 the part of my ignorance if I'm using the wrong words, but yeah, the, the skin yeah, well, yeah. and everything. So, what, yeah. So basically, um, yeah, it'll just go. It's all collected, and then it'll go to somewhere, probably abroad somewhere. Um, you know, and then probably maybe China or somewhere where it then goes into like, you know, cheap fashion, as it were, or mm. it's used as, um, so there's no, you know, it's, it's not, nobody knows where it actually goes in the, in the chain because it just goes into a big, you know, huge corporation and they probably just send it around the world. Mm. So there's no, like, you don't know where it goes. So these are probably really, really high quality products, but there's no perceived value because it all goes into what, you know, basically it's just treated, none of them are treated as a special 
you know, products. Every carcass and every skin around the world goes to one single place. There's and no provenance all. and there's no, no, there's no, there's no, no consideration no. for that carbon input, uh, impact yeah, or yeah. the environmental impact of the shipping or anything yeah. like that. I mean, I, I, would, I would definitely continue to get an Alice on because when I linked her up with um, Sally Abe, who was at the Harwood Arms, and they actually did a big um, event together, uh, you know, to, to the British Victorian Albert thing to celebrate it. So one of my, you know, I'm not bad at linking people. So I would say possibly getting, you know, Alice on and Sally would be quite an interesting yeah. thing. Because that, you know, they're going to talk about, I mean, I'm, you know, you can tell I'm waffling slightly because I'm not quite an expert, but I think those two together might be really interesting because that's, those two work together on it. And obviously Sally's doing great stuff and Alice is, but that was a really interesting put together of, you know, two really strong women who are, you know, nothing stops yeah. them really. Yeah. You know, so like Sally actually works at Harwood. So what she did, so she worked under Brett for like two or three years and, you know, Sally, she's not, you know, she's, I think, pretty tough. Um, yeah. So yeah. I was getting maybe. No, I love the. I'd love to have a chat with them. I think that would be, yeah. that would be amazing. So let's let's wrap up. So um, as as I said in the you know when we were chatting before, I do this little thing at the end of all of these interviews called ninety seconds with, which is nine <coughs> nine questions, yeah. ninety seconds. They always stay the same. If you're happy to quickly fly through, yeah. them. I mean, there's no stopwatch or anything. But I think the idea is let's keep them as as, as brief as, as as brief as yeah. possible. So um, I think it's all really around, you know, I, I, I think we've all become much more aware of, of, of the impact that we all have on, on, on the world. And I think particularly in hospitality, there's so, there's so much happening at the moment, which is really exciting, despite the, you know, the elephant, the bread, the lockdown pandemic elephant in the room. Um, and some, just a lot of, lot of innovation. And, and I, and I think people are now really focused on how how hospitality can make for want of a you know using a cliche phrase make the world a better place and i think we've all we've all realized how important hospitality and food is in our sense of belonging and community and and togetherness and we're all, yeah. we're all you know missing that <laughs> back in our bedrooms working um like we're 17 again um yeah. so uh, so these are always a little bit weighted towards that kind of slightly kind of purposeful approach but so yeah, okay. it, it, in terms of those nine questions what's the biggest single change in your life since the beginning of lockdown um i mean mine didn't change massively because i've sort of you know i've been just carrying on as normal um i think it was it was pivoting really it was realizing that under great i mean i you know probably suffered mental health issues for quite a long time but um with the lockdown i didn't like my brain just worked brilliantly so i think basically it was realizing that actually when you know now i'm probably a lot better than i was and yeah. i was able to keep myself very strong during what were challenging times really yeah fantastic and what's the one thing that's um, currently keeping you up at night um it's the the connection between the social media companies and government and corporations um that that's that's my biggest worry is you know if they want to stop us talking about you know regen ag they could they could just do it like that you know i think they're proving that at the moment we need another hour just on that to... yeah man, yeah, I'm just just, yeah, that I mean, it is, yeah i think i've probably yeah. touched on a bit of a you know that that is what's keeping me up at night yeah fair enough I guess uh, that's amazing um if you had to lay claim to a purpose in life what would it be um yeah um making my family farm the farm that's been in my family for 400 years profitable um what personal trait do you wish we had more of in the world empathy empathy um optimistic or pessimistic about humanity being able to save the world <laughs> 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 what i've learned is nature responds so so quickly if we give it a chance it can feed us easily but pessimistic for, you know, what I said in number two, you know, corporations and government and media companies working, you know, working together is, the, you know, they're, 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 they're going to fight for that, you know, but ultimately nature, my, it's face of a year, my soil is just transformed. You can see it. Nature, once you give it a chance, it's just there. Like nature's a phenomenal. Ready so go. very optimistic for nature. Excellent. And uh, which, um, in your opinion, what should we all be doing more or less of in hospitality to look after the world around us? Um, I think, um, you, I mean, obviously I'm going to say this, but I think hospitality needs to really start sourcing from, um, I wouldn't say, yeah, regenerative systems, really. There's a, the organisation, the first restaurant do were 28 well hung. Um, you know, they haven't got many plaudits, but they approached me about two years ago and they're totally sourcing from Regen Ag. I think people, it's time we're going to go, they're going to know if they're eating meat, it needs to be from a system that's actually home from the soil, I think. So I think sourced from products that are looking after the soil. 
Okay. And the next question was going to be, which hospitality businesses are you most impressed with when it comes to their pursuit of, uh, of kind of sustainability? So 20 yeah. of them are being I, one I, of them. Well, I think, you know, I would say Super 8, like, um, so obviously owners of Bratz, like, you know, no one even comes close to what they're doing. Like, they, they when they started Kiln, they said to us, how they, they based the whole restaurant on uh, our supply chain. How do we get the very best product from you? We'll design a whole supply of your restaurant around that, which no one's ever done. Yeah, just incredible. Yeah, so they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're really special. And who do you think is the most exciting up-and-coming industry star? Um, I'd say a chap called Vaughan Tan. I don't know if you've come across Vaughan, but um, no. I would say that the lady who talked to me about um, brain nutrition was probably the second cleverest person I've ever met in my life. Vaughan Tan is the smartest. Um, he's basically written a book, sort of, yeah, just look him up, Vaughan Tan. He actually wrote a piece for Eater London last year like about um what would happen with the sort of lockdowns and things he's just an incredibly smart guy who's traveled the world looking at hospitality in different areas and relating it to other things so yeah Vaughan Tan is just like he, he needs to be listened to definitely incredible Amazing. guy he's in, no, he's based in London he's not now I think he's moved away for a bit but yeah super super smart guy. I look him up for sure yeah uh, and then finally uh to end on uh if you could say one thing to one person right now <laughs> what would it be uh, who no, would honestly, it be? I, I, I'll be, I'll be honest, the other day when you sent me the questions, I cried my heart out. Like, I'm not joking. So, oh God. I sort of, you know, it's quite crazy. No, basically, I, I'll probably cry now. But yeah, I just want to ask my granddad really what he thinks, you know, of the changes yeah. in the farm. I can feel myself going now. But yeah, I, I just, every day, that's what I want to, you know, I just love to know what he thinks really. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> well, stay, stay on, and I'm, I'm going to hit. I'm going to hit. I'm, I'm, we'll end recording now, but we can have a little yeah. bit of a chat afterwards. So, Matt Chatfield, thank you so much for taking part, and uh, it was really. Uh, we've been talking now for an hour, so um, anyone who's still watching this, I hope it was worth it. Thank you. For yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Okay, up. cool.